In mythology, whenever we encounter the figure of a mighty goddess, she is usually associated with nature in a motherly way. She is the nature that brings life forth out of her bosoms, the fruit-bearing earth. She is also the dark mother that takes life back when the time comes, out of which she is born again. But the Greeks imagine a different nature and personified it with a goddess. She was the sublime spirit of nature, the lofty, shimmering mistress who brought death when she drew her golden bow, the huntress who ran with a mighty stag, the lonely goddess, queen of solitude, a goddess who brought delight yet could not love herself. And yet, just like nature, trembling with excitement and lightning beauty, she was Artemis, and today, in yet another interview of Ancient Greece Revisited, I have the honor to be sitting next to an expert in this goddess, Professor Spiridon Rangos, Professor of Philosophy in the Department of Literature in the University of Patras, who went to the wild nature of, of England uh, <laughs> in Cambridge uh, with the mission of researching and earning a PhD in Artemis, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, that's right. Why Artemis? Why Artemis? Um, that's a serious question. Um, for various reasons. Um, one, uh, rather trivial, uh, because uh, she was neglected in uh, modern literature. I mean, uh, there were no works um, um, dedicated to her, I mean, uh, no serious exploration about her nature. Mm -hmm. So there was a gap. Uh, there are other gods like uh, Dionysus, for instance, uh, or Apollo, uh, who have been studied quite well. Uh, but Artemis was rather neglected. Uh, but th this is a kind of uh, superficial uh, uh, reason. Another reason was um, that I felt uh, uh, personally uh, some kind of um, affinity or sympathy or whatever to connection, to, to, to connection yes, to, to, to this kind of, of goddess um, uh, who is um, uh, a maiden, um, uh, young, um, and uh, still uh, has also a cruel uh, aspect. And uh, well, so you were a young, a young man as well. <laughs> yes, so that's right. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I think that uh, um, uh, Artemis was, uh, um, a, a divine, was a divine figure that um, deserved better. Uh, <laughs> deserved better, <laughs> yeah. yes. So, that, that's why I decided to... It's true, there's almost like a star system in Olympus. Uh -huh. And some gods, you know, I lived abroad as well for many years, so I know that, you know, Zeus is, is very well known, obviously, he's the thunder god, and Dionysus on the other uh, extreme in that He's not even uh, uh, an immortal. Uh, he's also very well known. And yet other gods are not very well known, like Artemis. But this was not necessarily so for the ancient Greeks. And I've read somewhere, and I, I, I wish I could find that uh, reference, or that Artemis was almost like the goddess for ancient Greeks. Well, I'm not sure about that, uh, because uh, one aspect of Greek polytheism is that there is no the god or the goddess. Yes. Um, the, we have to distinguish between the panhellenic uh, pantheon and uh, the local uh, pantheons. And so it appears that in some places Artemis was a great uh, goddess. Uh, she was one of the great uh, goddesses um, worshipped in Sparta, for instance, uh, under the appellation of Orthia. Um, and Orthia yeah. means uh, standing tall. Yeah, upright, perhaps. And there's this image which is very Spartan of Artemis descending, I think it's in Homer, from Mount Taietos mm -hmm. uh, uh, down to hunt uh, and, and, and mixing with, uh, with the wood nymphs of, of that mountain. Uh -huh. And from afar, uh, Homer says that Leto, her mother, uh, is proud to see her daughter standing one head taller from all the other girls. That, that's right, that's right. I mean, um, the, the, uh, one, one of the um, uh, traits of Artemis um, is her beauty. 
She is called uh, uh, Kalisti, uh, most beautiful of, 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 of girls, of maidens. And uh, she is distinguished among the nymphs and uh, her companions by uh, the, the height and, 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 and beauty. Stature. Yeah, and Homer, uh, when he wants to compare, uh, to, to bring out Nafsika's beauty, mm. he compares her to, to Artemis in the way Artemis excels her yes. companions. That Odysseus, is the way. I think, when, when he witnesses yeah. Nafsika. Yeah. 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 Um, and, 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 and yet that beauty has a coldness to That's it. Right. It's That's not right. the beauty of Aphrodite. It's not that sexual beauty. No, no. It's, it's, it's not... Well, I think um, that, that, that's, that's a bit subtle, uh, I would say. Um, I wouldn't say that it's not sexual. Uh, I, I would say rather that it's not uh, sexual, explicitly sexual in the way that Aphrodite um, is, is the, the goddess of sexuality. Um, uh, it, it's not as sexual, uh, I, I would say. Uh, for instance, if you compare Artemis to the other two uh, virgin goddesses, uh, namely Athena and Hestia, Hestia uh, you would see that there is a difference there. There are virginity in those three cases represents a different thing. In the case of Athena, uh, virginity uh, is an aspect of uh, a, a, a woman who's not, uh, a girl who's not, uh, who's boyish, who's like a boy. A tomboy. Yeah, 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 that's right. A Athena is um, the daughter of her father. She's motherless. So she doesn't, and she's a war goddess. She doesn't have much to do with femininity. In the case of Estia, um, the Virginity is an aspect of purity, the purity of the hearth, the purity of the fireplace, the purity of, of, of the flame. So uh, in, in both cases, uh, virginity denotes lack of sexuality. Mm. I would think, and in the case of Artemis, this is not uh, uh, quite so. Uh, it's not lack of sexuality, but it's kind of um, contained or implicit sexuality, the sexuality of adolescence, uh, which, mm. which is not uh, yet um, uh, experienced in a mm. way. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I would qualify the, the sense in which uh, Artemis' is, um, uh, being is, is uh, asexual. I, Ye I think, yeah. Yes, yes, that, that, that is, and there's also a different, great difference between eroticism and sexuality, of mm -hmm. course. And, uh, so back in your life, so you left Greece and you went to Cambridge, I guess still one of the most famous uh, institutes uh, mm -hmm. for higher learning, especially in Greek. Um, what did you find there? Out, what, what was the climate? I remember um, in my first year there, I was sitting in the library and I was uh, reading about the excavations in the sanctuary of Artemis Othia in Sparta. And in, in that volume, uh, there was a, a black and white picture of uh, uh, Sparta in the 20s, 1920s, uh, with uh, the, the Mount Taigetus uh, behind. And uh, uh, that uh, picture uh, reminded me of the trip that I had uh, done the previous summer in Sparta. And I was there in um, uh, autumn or uh, early winter, uh, in uh, uh, raining outside, it was foggy, and um, uh, I felt that I was so far away from Sparta, uh, in a different country, speaking uh, a different language, and um, in order to study Artemis of, yes. of Sparta. And uh, that, was, that was quite strange. Because, uh, so, uh, this is a reminiscence. I, I, I remember that I felt um, uh, not very at ease uh, having to be in Cambridge in order to study. Uh, Yet there uh, was yeah, something very uh, Artemis-like in that, because talking about nature, um, Artemis was also uh, represented that distance, that, that uh, awayness of nature. Um, she was not the nature, she was definitely not the nature of the garden, well, mm -hmm. which is why perhaps where That's we're right. sitting is an excellent contrast of what Artemis is not. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not the contained nature, she's the nature that 
uh, is almost unapproachable. So perhaps it was very fitting <laughs> to be so far away. That's a good idea. I mean, I had, uh, but, but back then, uh, this had not occurred to me. Okay. Uh, so I, I felt rather uh, a sense that um, due to uh, perhaps um, uh, the, the, the quality of education there had to be there and uh, I learned um, very many things um, uh, and so I felt that um, um, it, it was a, a good idea uh, to be there but still uh, I had this feeling yeah. that it's it almost would, like it, a guilt yeah it, it, that it would be nice which is a guilt yeah which yeah. is not about you obviously because you didn't do yeah. anything um, but you feel like it should be the other way around that's right i mean for instance one would imagine that uh, people uh, should come to Greece, to, Greece to, 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 study. to study those things. I mean, uh, and uh, in England, people asked me, what, what do you do? And I did, uh, I said, um, uh, Greek um, philosophy, Greek, Greek literature, and I said, uh, Greek literature here, why not in, in Greece? So, so yes. But uh, back to, 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 to our subject, I would say that you're absolutely right. I mean, Artemis represents nature, but the kind of nature that is uncontained, um, uh, disorderly, or, or with a hidden kind of order, mm. uh, not um, uh, contaminated by human presence and civilization and uh, organization, um, a kind of nature that is um, uncultivated. Um, uh, so all, all the the, the, that we associate with wilderness, mm -hmm. which is which has a serene uh, and uh, seducive um, aspect, but also a very uh, uh, frightening um, mm -hmm. uh, aspect. And I've heard that in her sacred groves, it was not allowed to bring metals um, in uh, in case you would pollute them. I guess metal was the technology mm -hmm. of antiquity. Perhaps today you wouldn't be able to bring your <laughs> silicon phones, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, but which, which is very interesting. And on that subject, I think it's very important to distinguish because what I've been noticing and experiencing to a certain degree is that there is in, in our times a craving for, for even mysticism, you know, uh, whether people do it chemically through psychedelics, there's, there's a lot of people who will travel down to Peru to experience, you know, uh, like shamanic, you know, uh, plant medicines as they call them. And, uh, you know, even a return to the Greek Orthodox Church, which I never expected to find, mm -hmm. uh, even from uh, Americans. And the, it's all, and in between, you know, you have a, a, anything from tarot readings, uh, star signs, um, and it's always, always, always a, a craving for the, the secretive, the mystic, the dark, the chthonic. And these things, it's true that in mythology, just the way I started, were always represented by the feminine. You know, like one of these plant medicines is called ayahuasca, which is like represented as a goddess. And she's always the people who experience this, this, this vine, this experience. They always report, you know, perhaps encounters with a goddess who is not Artemis, a mm -hmm. goddess who is not even Greek. Uh, ayahuasca, just to bring a different tangent, would pertain to a pre-Greek pantheon, mm -hmm. a chthonic, like a Minoan world, out of which the 12 gods emerged. And Artemis, being the f feminine representation, stands in contrast with these mother goddesses. That's right. That's right. Um, in the Greek pantheon, one would say that the mother goddess par excellence is uh, represented by Demeter. Uh, uh, the mother goddess in the sense of the wife and mother as well is Hera. Uh, so uh, Artemis is nothing uh, of the sort. Um, it's a different archetype. Uh, if, if you wish, mm -hmm. um, it's it's the archetype of um, of um, maidenly uh, beauty and adolescence and uh, nature, of course. Uh, so yeah, it's, femininity is not one thing. I mean, uh, in the way it's um, represented in in Greek religion, that different different many different aspects, and the aspect that Artemis stands for 
is um, that aspect of um, um, wildness and mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and uh, what I, do you I, make on that distinction? I mean, one one thing uh, that we can notice is that the Greeks did not worship animal gods. The twelve gods, uh, none of the twelve gods had had an animal form. I guess in other cultures, a god is like Artemis would be represented, or almost like a werewolf type of, you know, half woman, half being, mm -hmm. but not in Greece. That's right. Um, the so-called anthropomorphism is a distinctive, um, I would say, um, characteristic of, of, of Greek religion. And uh, perhaps we take it for granted, but it, it, it's, it's, it, it should not be taken for granted uh, because it is, in a way, a creation of the spirit. I mean, it's to represent gods as human beings is one of the many options uh, you have, and it's it's not the most common. Uh, I mean, at least in historically. The historically, in the exclusive way in which it was uh, done in in uh, in Greece. What does it mean to to have human like gods? You can you can see it from various perspectives, but one perspective would be that you take the human form and the human body as an adequate vehicle for divinity. Mm. So instead, we, we usually say that the Greeks were kind of childish or silly and they represented gods as if they were humans. But one can see it the other way around that the Greeks represented gods as humans because they saw that there is something divine in the human form. Perhaps uh, they represented the, humans the, as gods. The, the, that's right. So I, I think that it is actually a poetical uh, creation to have gods as the, the way the Greeks had them. I, mean, as, as, I think it's as, a very as, beautiful thing you said there, yeah. that they saw the human form as an adequate vehicle for divinity. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, let me draw a parallel. Um, Thucydides tells us that um, in the Olympic Games, when they were instituted in the 8th century, uh, people competed uh, not naked, but with, uh, with some clothes. And nakedness was something that came over time. Uh, some, some years later, they decided to uh, drop the, 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 the clothes and to, to compete in naked form. So nakedness in the Olympic Games is not a, a sign of uh, savagery or lack of civilization, nothing of the sort. It's conscious choice which has something to do with, with um, um, the, 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 the spectacle and the, the way you, you, you feel about it. So that, it, it's, a matter, it's a matter of civilization. So I, w I mean, that's a parallel. I, I would say that to have gods in um, human form is not something that is obvious and natural. It's, it's a conscious, uh, kind of conscious choice, so a poetical creation. Yes. and. I, I guess the great interest with all these things is try to ex do exactly what we're trying to do in this show, to recapture something of the, of the, of the Greek, um, not, not spirit, that's very commonplace, of the Greek imaginary. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talked about Cornelius Castoriadis and we had a very uh, good interview with an expert. And uh, he, Castoriadis spoke about the, the Greek uniqueness, the, 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 what made Greece was a specific conception of the world. And I think you find this conception in Homer and everything that made Greece, you find it. And there you find all the gods and you find Artemis uh, there. And I think Artemis is a goddess that could not have existed in a different pantheon. Probably, most probably, I would, I, I would, I would agree. Um, it, um, it, she's, a, she's a very, very uh, distinctive... Uh, uh, what did you learn in Cambridge that you didn't know before about Artemis? Um, 
Well, I, I, I was um, supervised by Professor Paul Cartledge and uh, uh, he is, he was and he uh, still is a, an expert uh, in um, Greek history basically, but most, um, uh, more specifically in the history of Sparta. Uh, so uh, one of the main cults of Artemis uh, was in, in Sparta and was a kind of, uh, according to the sources, it was a kind of cruel um, uh, cult with flagellation um, among other things. And uh, so I learned um, um, very many things about um, the, 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 um, the context of this, um, of this cult. Uh, yeah, and, and, li uh, and like I said, it's a very f she's a very fitting goddess for, for Spartans. Yeah. So what, what, what is the relationship there between the Spartan ideal, perhaps, and, and Artemis? Uh, well, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, moralizing. Uh, there, so uh, we, we cannot be sure um, whether the sources are um, um, bring an aspect which which was not there uh, originally. But but um, the the cult of uh, of Artemis uh, Orthia in Sparta uh, was uh, um, kind of uh, related to the ideal of uh, endurance. Uh, so youths were flagellated and uh, they were supposed to endure without a sound, without a grimace, without a, any, any, any sign of feeling pain. And um, uh, so one aspect of the cult was the cultivation of um, bravery or kind of uh, the sense of, of endurance. And Artemis, because she was um, um, uh, um, a uh, uh, wild goddess and uh, demanded as a substitute, a surrogate of uh, sacrifice, demanded um, her altar to be spilt with, with human blood. Mm -hmm. But the blood was not the blood of sacrifice, but the blood of wounds. But now, from what I know, she was also associated with some kind of, sa of sacrifice. That's well. right. That's right. And the kind, because uh, the, uh, allegedly, I mean, in myth, the, the cult um, included the ancient Xoanon, the ancient cult statue mm -hmm. of Artemis, which was brought from the land of uh, Tauri in um, uh, 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 the Black Sea. Uh, and so the Spartans claimed that the original um, cult statue of the goddess from the Black Sea was there. The Athenians claimed the same in Brabron. So, uh, but this cult, the cult of so-called Artemis Tavropolos, Tavropolos, uh, was the most kind of um, cruel and um, um, bloodthirsty uh, cult. It was and it was associated with human sacrifice. Um, we know from um, Euripides the, the, the story of um, Iphigenia. Is, yeah, Iphigenia, and uh, she the, was sacrificed. She was sacrificed uh, uh, according according to Aeschylus. She was sacrificed. I mean, there was no surrogate stag, mm. uh, as as in later versions. In in later versions, she was not sacrificed, but she was taken by, by Artemis and brought up uh, to uh, the Black Sea and, and uh, a stag was sacrificed in her place. But uh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a later uh, elaboration on, on, on the myth. Most probably the original myth. Almost like in the Bible, that's right. uh, Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. And another aspect of Artemis is her, her distance. If you compare her with Athena, who's also a virgin, and has this warrior aspect, Athena is very approachable. Athena is the goddess of heroes. She is ever present when a hero is in need. She appears like she appeared in Odysseus right next, and her aspect is very familiar, uh, not motherly, but almost like, you know, uh, the older sister that you never had kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But this is not Artemis. Artemis is, is the distant. That's right. Is the distant, like the wilderness mm -hmm. is distant, and her weapon, is not the shield and the spear, like in the case of Athena. It's the arrow, the golden, the golden uh, bow. Mm -hmm. and what, what do we make of this, of this uh, distance? It's, um, as you said, um, the, the, the arrow and the bow are symbols of, uh, of that distance. And uh, in this aspect, um, Artemis 
relates to her brother Apollo, because Apollo also is an archer, and also he is the god of distance. He's called uh, Hekaergos, who works things from afar. Mm. And um, so this distance um, is a kind of um, an indication of a, a sublime uh, divine nature, which is an image of um, perfection, uh, one might say. Uh, if you compare Artemis to Athena, as you uh, did, you see that Athena is kind of whispering things and um, advices to her protege, like uh, Odysseus or Di Diomedes and uh, others. And she's very close by. Uh, whereas uh, Artemis always works from, from afar. And it is interesting that in this sense, um, Artemis is related to Athena in the same way as Apollo is related to Dionysus. I mean, mm. um, uh, there are complementary opposites, mm. one might say, uh, different, different, different aspects. And Apollo was really in importance, uh, perhaps not many people understand, he was almost like second in importance to Zeus. Mm. He was very yeah. important in the, and he was the most human in form of the gods in, f in aspect, in form. He was like the young man, the body in perfection. That's right. And Artemis was his uh, sister. Yeah, and the equivalent... The equivalent in, in, in femininity. Th that's right, the equivalent in femininity. But I would, I would suggest that in the same way that um, Apollo relates to Dionysus, Artemis relates to um, Athena in, 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 in the way you, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Namely, Dionysus is a god of kind of universal life. Mm -hmm. And it has no sense of um, individuality. Of boundaries. Of bound it's it, it's the, 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 the god who kind of breaks up boundaries. Yeah. And um, uh, Apollo, by contrast, is the god of the individual, of the, 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 the person uh, as a perfection. And one of Dionysus' uh, epithets was Lysios, the dissolver. And I know one scholar, uh, Danielu, compared him with Shiva mm -hmm. in uh, India, exactly for what you said, he dissolves boundaries while Apollo draws boundaries. And obviously we can take it very far into the nature of being as the two aspects of being one with the universe and being a separate ego. Uh, but that would be perhaps a different uh, conversation. Um, I would like to draw attention on something that you actually you, you made me aware of in one of our conversations, that in Homer, which is, like I said, was almost like the Bible of the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. Artemis' image is somehow um, subdued, it's somehow diminished. Um, Artemis is presented, I think she has a quarrel with a mortal or... Yeah, um, yeah. In, 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 in Homer, uh, Artemis' um, presence is not very pronounced. For instance, in the Odyssey, she doesn't make any appearance. I mean, she's apart from the simile with Nafsika. Yeah, I mean, she she's, she's, she doesn't make an entry mm. on stage, for instance. I mean, she's, she's not present anywhere. She's mentioned. Nafsika is compared to her. Um, um, she's mentioned several places, but she doesn't do a thing, and she doesn't appear in person. In the Iliad, she appears, but she cuts a rather sorry uh, uh, figure. Um, because um, she's um, in the Battle of Gods, in the uh, 21st um, Rhapsody, um, she reprimands uh, her brother Apollo for not standing fast against Poseidon. Apollo retreats without a word. And uh, the reason that he didn't fight with Poseidon uh, was that um, he felt kind of um, 
beneath uh, shame. Them. No, it was because uh, the, 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 the poem says it was because uh, he was ashamed to fight his uncle. Mm. I uh, think he, he was ashamed to fight in the name of mortals because it was the battle of Troy that divided precisely. the gods. That's right. So Apollo is so lofty, so, that's right. so sublime that he doesn't even... That's right, that's right. And though cast, um, Artemis castigates him, and then she stands opposed to Hera, and that's, that's interesting. Um, adolescence versus maturity, femininity in different aspects. She stands opposed to, 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 to Hera, and um, uh, they're about to, uh, to fight, but Hera grabs her and she slaps her with, with, with her own arrows, I mean Artemis' own arrows, and then she runs away and she goes to crying to, to, to her father, uh, Zeus on Olympus. Like a, an adolescent. That's right, a girl. A uh, girl. Yeah, yeah, and she's compared to, to, to a pigeon, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, which, which flies away to avoid a falcon. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's her presence in, in the Iliad, and that's kind of comical, uh, basically. Yeah. And one might think, why Artemis, uh, who we know in cult was a very prominent uh, deity, why was she so um, downgraded? Perhaps that has something to do with her own nature, uh, with the fact that she belongs to the forest, she belongs to, um, to uh, places, mountain tops, places uh, where um, civilization is absent and warfare, I mean, as a human um, thing, as, as, as something made by humans with, with set rules and things. So um, perhaps that's the reason she's uh, not absent, but uh, I mean, peripheral. In, in, in the Iliad, and so is Dionysus, uh, who's, um, uh, who is another god who has to do with, 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 with nature. by human yeah, as Yes, well. that's right, with, by, yeah, by Lycurgos, the, yes. the king, yeah. yes, that's right. It's a very strange image, like yeah. the gods being defeated by humans, <laughs> that's almost. Right. Yeah. Uh, but not Apollo. Yeah. Ap Ap yeah. Apollo will always yeah. draw yeah. the line. And I guess moving to the present day with all these things, we live in a very confused uh, time, and uh, lately this year seems to have gotten only more confusing uh, in many different aspects. But what I've been noticing, uh, you know, among people I know, among people I meet online, is that there is a craving for a reconnection with this pagan past. And people take it in very different ways. Like I said, there's people who run to the, to the Amazon to take something like ay ayahuasca. There's people who study, you know, black magic. There's people who study paganism. There's people who go into the Indo what they consider to be the Indo-European roots of Europe. Um, but they do it, most of them, in a very clumsy way. And in the case of ancient Greek religion, they mix at least two aspects of Greek religion. One that they enjoy much more is the whole Orphic, Pythagorean, perhaps Platonic kind of mysticism. The image of the uh, of Dionysus, it, Orpheus is like another Dionysus. So it's the image of the, the dying God who gets resurrected, um, the promise of reincarnation, um, the, uh, the cycle of life that whatever happens is just like a dream and you're going to wake up and then you're going to have another dream. All this spirituality that came in prominence in the 60s, uh, mainly through the East and through Eastern religions and through the hippie movement. And somehow people have these lenses and then they look in ancient Greece and they can't distinguish between the clarity of light, which we find in Homeric religion, and the chthonic, one with nature, everything is one, Shiva, Kali, Asp, of Orpheism. Mm -hmm. What? I, well, um, I, I think there were two currents in, in, in Greek religion. It's important it, to clarify yeah. this. There, One was, was, was the Olympian um, view. The Homeric. The Homeric, the Olympic uh, view of things. And this is, if we want to speak in terms of mystery, it, it is all about the mystery of light. Of, of light. 
the mystery of vision, the mystery of uh, de delineation, the mystery of appearance. Of, of appearance. The mystery of things yeah, coming yeah, forth. That's right. Manifesting. And so it's, it's, it's all clarity. Or, I mean, and, and uh, the, uh, Zeus is the god of the sky, of, also of the clear sky, Ethereus. And lightning, which yeah, is yeah, uh, that's right. the, the, the light in darkness. That's right. Uh, which all of a sudden, everything yeah. becomes for a while. And but side by side with this, uh, you have also. Uh, Presumably, in, in Homer's time as well, you, all, uh, you had also chthonic uh, cults, cults associated with, with earth, cults associated with the mystery of uh, birth and death, and you do have these things. Now, um, those things go in parallel, and uh, after a while, perhaps in, in the 6th century, there is a kind of um, uh, resurgence of interest in, um, in uh, the afterlife with Orphism and with Pythagoreans and, and a new idea emerges, an, an idea about kind of salvation mm. after death, kind of a good um, um, uh, fate, a postmodern good fate. Um, you had that in the mysteries, kind of the Illusionian mysteries, and, but, but now uh, from the 6th century onwards and especially in the 5th and um, the 4th, it becomes, uh, this movement becomes prominent. Now, you are right, uh, people that want to kind of relate to ancient religion, perhaps because of the Christian um, antecedents, they relate to th mostly to this mystical view of things, which is not the Homeric, not the Olympian yes. uh, view of things, not, not the mystery of light, but rather the mystery of darkness. darkness. And, uh, yeah. and the, it's, it's fascinating to me because they somehow, and I, I can relate to that because back in my younger days, you know, I was very interested in like Indian gurus. I remember reading a lot of Osho, mm -hmm. Bhagwan, mm -hmm. Rajneesh was his name, and th th he definitely, being in Hindu, like uh, coming from that Hindu culture, saw that mysterious aspect more prominently you know he had night vision so to speak he was mm -hmm. like the owl of Minerva but as, as I grew older it's exactly how um, in the sophist I think it was in Plato's sophist that the sophist says something to the effect of when I was young I was fascinated with not being with 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 nothingness and I know some of my friends who have children they've noticed that children go through a phase that they go crazy with the idea of nothingness. You know, they ask like, how, how can there be nothingness? And I guess the sophist was relating to that. But then he says, the sophist, he says, as I grew older, I realized that what's more fascinating is being rather than not being. Mm -hmm. That things exist is much more mysterious than things not existing. And somehow there's a mystery in the light that people do not see because light somehow reveals everything a part of its own self, mm -hmm. right? You're absolutely right, and, and the sophist, uh, in Plato's sophist, um, says that uh, in the past we used to know what being is, but now we are puzzled about it. Nim the aporikamen. We knew it, we took it for granted, being. We took it for granted, but now we have come to realize it cannot be taken for granted. It's being is the mystery. Is the mystery. Yeah. And somehow the Greeks in Homeric view presented it as on a platter, like it is what it is here, mm -hmm. with no explanations, yet with just an intimacy mm -hmm. uh, that you find there. Yes, yes. And one, one, one other, I guess, contradiction with Artemis is that while she was a virgin, she was also goddess of childbirth. That's right. And uh, yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you bring it up because uh, it's, it's one of the apparent contradictions. How can a virgin goddess be um, supervisor of the very process of, um, of, um, of birth? Uh, so I think that the, the, the solution to this riddle uh, has to do with um, the, 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 the wild kind of nature of giving birth. Um, Artemis is not a mother goddess, and is not, she's not as a mother goddess that she assists 
um, uh, women in labor. Uh, on the contrary, because it's associated with uh, wild nature and because the embryo and the, the, the newborn child is almost at the limit of humanity, is almost, almost an animal rather than a, mm. a, 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 a fully uh, grown uh, human being. So because, because it's for that very reason that Artemis uh, acts as a midwife in, in, in labor. And uh, it's the animal side, the wild side of, uh, of, um, of, childbirth. of, of childbirth. That, that and if I remember correctly, the, there was this belief in ancient Greece that the birth pangs of pregnant women were like the arrows of Artemis. Uh, in a sense, yes. And that is why she was uh, invoked to... Um, to cure the... To, uh, to cure and to kind of... Um, um, subdue the pains. Yes, yes, subdue the pains. Uh, and uh, some people claimed that uh, because of Artemis' um, help, uh, some women, uh, they had a very easy labor, uh, very, very, uh, mm -hmm. they, they gave birth quite easily. Uh, but the arrows of, of Artemis were, were also the means uh, of uh, uh, killing women in, in, childbirth. In, in childbirth. So women that lost their lives uh, in, in, during uh, labor uh, were supposed to be killed by, by, Artemis. by Artemis. And it's this very strange for modern man and for Christian man, uh, and modern man is, is like an offshoot of Christian right. man in one way or another, to understand this dual nature of pagan gods, that um, they're somehow beyond morality, mm -hmm. um, that it's very hard for us to understand that a god who was worshipped and prayed to had also committed uh, ruthless crimes in a way. And in the case of Artemis, there's this myth that perhaps you could recount of um, she and her brother Apollo uh, took vengeance upon an insult against their mother, Leto, uh, a, a mortal, if I'm not mistaken, uh, claimed that while Leto only had two children, she had 14, I think, or something. And then the Apollo killed all the boys and Artemis killed all the girls. Yeah, it's mentioned in the Iliad. It's Niobe, uh, the, 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 the woman who claimed uh, that um, she, she, she has more uh, uh, children than, than Leto. And, uh, uh, Which that, is that, terrible. That, 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 was, that was an act, an act of hubris. Uh, an act yeah. of hubris, yeah. but it, it's a terrible crime for us. No. So how do we reconcile like, this difference between a world for us that has good and evil and a pagan world where... To quote uh, Walter Otto, um, uh, an, an expert in, uh, in, in Greek religion in the, the 20th century, I would say that um, Greek religion is the sanctification of objective being. So objective being uh, is what is. Um, it's not um, divided into good and evil. Uh, one might say that um, it's all good, or, but basically it is what it is. So if you want to sanctify what is, uh, I, I would say you end up with something like um, the Greek uh, uh, pantheon, the Greek uh, religion, uh, which is precisely beyond or um, beside uh, good and good and evil, mm -hmm. and uh, and m morality uh, is something that comes rather late in in uh, in, in in the case of um, uh, Greek uh, culture uh, to the gods. I mean, for for instance, the first clear signs of um, a moralizing attitude uh, you can find in Plato's Republic. Uh, where, where Socrates says that uh, I do not believe that, that gods are causes of everything for the simple reason that gods cannot be causes of evil things. So half or perhaps more than half of the doings of gods in, in, in traditional mythology uh, are excluded in the case of, uh, uh, of, of Plato. So by then, perhaps already with Socrates, uh, gods are not um, causes of all things, but only of good things. 
but that but comes late. That but comes this, late. this is the, the, the original. The, 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 this is the fourth century, and you know, um, there's, there's a kind of uh, an interesting thing happens there, that by making traditional gods do only good things, there's something above gods, the idea of the, of good, the good itself, of the good itself, which puts, sets limits to the ability of God. So uh, now in the fourth century, according to, to Plato, gods are not able to do whatever they wish, mm. as in traditional mm. uh, mythology, but they have to obey the good. It, it, and this is, this is, this is a, a, a late But thing. it's very interesting how it also comes in a period of relative decadence. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the very uh, original inceptual Greece that gave birth to everything that made Greece, there was this a moral aspect, yet as we enter the Hellenistic, it becomes much more moralistic and much more spiritual just when it's declining. So it's strange that somehow morality is connected with decline. Can we see a... <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, the famous, the famous image of, um, of Hegel's uh, about uh, uh, the, 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 the... Owl the, of Minerva. Yes, yes, the, the, the bird, uh, the, yeah. uh, the owl uh, of, of Minerva that comes out uh, late at night, meaning uh, only when culture has declined, the kind of um, um, retrospective thinking or philosophy uh, comes to maturity. So perhaps there's something similar with, with morality. So we understand what yeah. was good and what was evil yeah. after That's <laughs> right. yeah. the whole thing yeah. is over. Yeah. And as you said, like the true being, like Walter Otto, who is part of a very interesting intellectual movement, uh, sometimes called the Conservative Revolution. He was part of a group of German intellectuals. Mart Martin Heidegger perhaps stands as the, the, the giant mm -hmm. in this. Uh, um, who tried to come back to this, what they would call an inceptual understanding of antiquity, not that museum kind of, but re not, not, not a museum type and not a cheap reliving, um, which is something that we suffer as well, because when we started this show, we tried to do anything to avoid the very typical dressed in white, <laughs> go uh, carrying torches up, you know, that's the exact antithesis of what we try to do. So. It's this idea of understanding how they connected with being. It is within our mission to try and understand and then clarify what exactly were the Greek gods. And it's interesting to start from what they were not. So many people today, and I guess people who are somewhat hostile uh, they, uh, to this Greek pagan, um, they wouldn't imagine the Greek gods as like a giant person in the case of Artemis, like a giant uh, young girl, you know, walking on Mount Olympus, which is a comic, like mm -hmm. an image for, but these were not the Greek gods. They were depicted in human form, but they were not that. H how can we clarify this a little bit? Uh, as we said um, earlier, the, the human form is, is a vehicle, and it is also a sign, a symbol, one might say, through which um, something is expressed. And uh, what is expressed is, I would say, divine presence. And divine presence means um, a core of reality or of, of an aspect of reality in each case. And each and every god is a particular perspective, a particular way of, of, of seeing uh, things. And that is why Greek gods are so uh, different from each other, although they form a family of gods. And uh, that is why in different um, stages of life, people uh, address different gods and in different um, uh, phases, in different, in, um, as life progresses, uh, one may abandon one god and uh, devote oneself to another. So for instance, 
um, in the case of uh, Hippolytus, um, dramatized by, by Euripides. Uh, the problem with Hippolytus is that he's a devotee of Artemis, and he wants to stick to that for the entire life. Mm. And that is something abnormal, one might say, because one has to be a devotee of Artemis at, the st at a certain age, but then one has to progress into marriage and get, become a devotee of Aphrodite, which is the very opposite. So, um, Greek gods and goddesses are aspects, uh, perspectives um, of, 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 uh, of what is. Uh, um, and in that sense, they are not superhuman humans. <laughs> I mm. mean, kind of big uh, figures. B big uh, fellows. Uh, yeah. It, in, in your case, did you understand your affinity with Artemis as you studied her? What was your personal connection? Did you go into this almost psychoanalysis while in Cambridge? No, I wouldn't say so. I would say perhaps that this was an insight that came later. Uh, not, I didn't, I, it wasn't very clear to me why I had chosen uh, Artemis. Um, I thought uh, there, was an, there was something of an appeal to me, but um, it was also um, the more practical matter of um, doing something in which uh, not very many studies have been devoted. Okay, uh, but it was only later that I realized uh, that um, this ideal or this aspect of, of being which is related to wilderness, related to uh, the beauty of adolescence, related to uh, femininity, uh, um, kind of pure femininity in the sense of virginity. All, all, these, all these things um, made a, a, an appeal to me. But that, that was something that I realized uh, only later. It was a kind of um, subsequent, retrospective uh, thought. Uh, and I realized that I had some intimate uh, connection uh, with, uh, with, with Artemis, but not while you, I was... You did not suffer the fate of, of Hippolytus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I haven't. <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, and uh, I, 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 at least I, I would like to uh, say that I was not so one-sided <laughs> as, as uh, Hippolytus was. And on that aspect of virginity, because obviously, again, talking about modern man and Christian man, there is a great worship of a virgin lady, mm -hmm. Mother Mary. Um, yes, but, but in that case, you know, you have this mixture of contradictory uh, aspects. You have um, a virgin who is also a mother. In the Greek pantheon, the two aspects were assigned to different goddesses. Mm. Uh, Artemis was a virgin, but uh, she was not a mother. And um, other goddesses like Hera or um, Demeter were mothers and uh, no longer virgins. Now, of course, um, there is an aspect in which uh, in, in a woman's life, virginity and uh, motherhood may alternate. Um, virginity is not just lack of sexual experience. It may be the necessary preliminary stage in which um, the desire uh, grows in order for the body to be ready for copulation and impregnation. Like the maturation of the That's fruit. right, yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, in, in, in the image of uh, Virgin Mary, you have, in a sense, two different and uh, to a certain extent incompatible uh, archetypes mixed together. Uh, and they were separate in, in, in Greek. Yet they were both worshipped in Ephesus. In, in the case of uh, Artemis uh, uh, at Ephesus, yes, but uh, that was not a very typical uh, Artemis. It was, she was a very atypical, one mm. might say, because there she was represented, you know, with um, many breasts mm -hmm. um, or it's not sure whether they were breasts or 
testicles, perhaps bull's testicles, and some people more recently have suggested that um, there were kind of um, bags in which um, precious things and the food was kept. In any case, she was represented with many um, life-giving uh, life things. Glands, yeah, that's right. Almost. Yeah. And uh, in that sense, I mean, the, the image and the cult, uh, so far as we can tell, was very atypical. Uh, I think that um, Artemis of Ephesus was a rather uh, oriental uh, goddess of the type you mentioned at the beginning of, mm -hmm. of our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was... But, the, but Mother Mary is an oriental goddess. As well. uh, okay, uh, but uh, I said that in the case of Ephesus, the Artemis there was atypical. Mm. Um, so yes, there was a she mixture. She was not the of, Artemis of Sparta. That's right. She was not the Artemis of Sparta. She was not the Artemis of um, Patras. She was not the Artemis of of, uh, of Athens, uh, because in all those cases, Artemis. Uh, I think we haven't mentioned uh, uh, was that Artemis was also a goddess of transition. Um, uh, uh, she had uh, rites of passage and she was the goddess that enabled adolescents uh, um, or I mean boys and girls to proceed to the stage of um, adulthood. So she was on the side of youth obviously but uh, people had to, to, to undergo uh, an experience of um, of uh, transition in order to become ready, psychologically ready, to proceed to the stage, to the next um, stage in, in, in life. And so, uh, for instance, in, in, um, in Attica, um, the a sanctuary of um, Artemis, uh, in a sanctuary of Artemis, there were little girls um, before puberty. Um, uh, from the age of uh, five to ten, perhaps, um, and um, they were um, devoted to the goddess. And as soon as um, menstruation began, uh, before menstruation, uh, they had to, to leave because by then they had become kind women. of women. And similarly, in the case of uh, Artemis Orthia in, in, in Sparta, uh, boys were. Um, uh, devoted to her cult in order to become adults. Um, so, yeah, she has that aspect of she presides over uh, rites of, of, passage. of passage. And she's a. Th that is also why some people like uh, Jean, uh, uh, like Vernon, uh, have said that uh, Artemis represents marginality. She's mm -hmm. a, a goddess of the margins, of the liminal, of the acra, yeah, yeah, of, of the, li um, of the, of the acra on, on the one hand, of the extremity, uh, but also of uh, the margins between two different stages. And, and moving like towards the end, I guess, um, now we live after 2000 years of Christianity. And again, what I find with people who want to escape it, they feel constrained by it, although in all honesty there's nothing to be constrained anymore. I mean, I keep meeting people who pretend that they've been so repressed by Christianity, but I just don't have a different opinion on exactly why they were repressed. And they want to escape it and they, 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 they want to go back. Is there a path to meet the gods again? A very, very difficult question, I guess, because th there's a trap. The trap is uh, it's called make-believe. Um, for instance, you, you may think through your reading that you uh, relate, but um, I think that um, religion in general is has something to do with natural emergence. It emerges in some historical periods as a kind of revelation, and then it goes on. And if a religion dies, a particular view of the world dies with it, I'm not sure whether it can be resurrected. So um, the, it's, it, it's always the same problem, um, also with philosophy. I mean, um, you can 
understand and interpret Plato and, and Aristotle and even the pre-Socratics, but uh, and to a certain way you can give blood to the corpses and kind of make them alive again, but always it has to be something new because life is ever new. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the answer, well, it's not an answer, but it, it's yes and no. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can relate, but you cannot. It's, it's uh, almost it's like Heidegger's last, well, perhaps yeah. it wasn't the last thing he ever said, but the last famous thing he said is that only, only was it only a god? A god. A god. A god. A, can, a yeah. god can save us now. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere between pessimistic and optimistic, I yeah, guess. Yeah, but it, it, there is something in history which seems not to lie upon us. I mean, as as persons and as as societies, that the, there seems that history has also its own rhythm mm. and mm -hmm. its its own uh, kind of pattern, and we can contribute or resist it, but we cannot. Are we moving towards? a new enchantment of the world or a continuous disenchantment of the world? I don't know. What I do know is that um, uh, we are unhappy mm. wi with disenchantment and we, 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 we live in, in this disenchantment. disenchantment. We, we experience, I mean, the, the, the world is no longer full of presences as yes. it used to be. So um, the need is here, the need is here. Whether we're moving to, uh, w whether it will be filled properly or non-properly or what will happen, I, I do not know. Can, can the gods coexist with technology? Can the gods appear in an age of the internet, for example? Because, and, I, and I'm asking this because if you went to some very primitive, perhaps, uh, uh, pantheons, um, you could say no because you saw that the people worshipping them were not technical at all. But the Greeks were technical, they were technological, they kept worshipping while they knew quite a lot of things about the world. So it, 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 almost like they give hope that it's not, technology is not like a poison that dissolves magic. Like, could Artemis exist in a technological world? I'm not sure how to, to answer that, um, that question, because I think that technology teaches us the way, the manner, the how, not the why. And, uh, I mean, our extensive knowledge of uh, the laws of nature uh, has not ad make us advance a single step in the question about why Me and, meaning. About and meaning. So uh, to, 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 to that extent I think that um, uh, religion can coexist with, with science. The really crucial question is what kind of religion? Uh, it, because if one wants to lead a harmonious life, one's religion must be um, um, in harmony with one's beliefs, scientific beliefs or scientific worldview. And uh, so far, uh, one says, one understands that uh, the scientific worldview is um, incompatible with Christian religion and the death of God already mm -hmm. announced in the 19th century had something to do with this incompatibility. Of so um, it's like we kn we know too much. Yeah, we know we too know, much, but uh, we know nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other on the other hand, yeah. So wrapping up, uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, talking, and perhaps there was a bit there was a bit of magic in that. There was, uh, but uh, you know, a present perhaps. It's up to the viewers to judge. Um, so in any case, uh, you know, we wish you the best. And, Thank you very uh, much. We're definitely going to keep in touch. Um, I'm sure we have more, more to say. We already talked preliminary uh, about things that might get a bit more political, more controversial, but they're also very important in an age, uh, in the age that we're living in. Um, so I'm going to thank you on behalf of myself and the team. 
And thank uh, you very much. Uh, hope to see you very, very soon. The pleasure was all mine.